Hey everyone, welcome to Tim's Vinyl Confessions and welcome back to the Kansas Deep Dive. We're rolling right along here, uh, going through each of the Kansas studio albums and it's going to change very soon, but so far everybody I've had as a co-host has been a contributor to my Kansas album review book, Let It Be Your Guide, Kansas album review. And so I'm talking to this gentleman here, which who should be no stranger to any of you, Mr. Jex Russell. Jex, how you doing? Hey, Tim. Good. Uh, thanks for having me. How are you doing? And we're going to be talking to Jex about an album that he is part of the chapter. Uh, so this this should be quite easy. No, it's actually one of my my favorite Kansas albums. 1986 is Power. Uh, I've got this copy here that's it's open, but it's still got the shrink wrap on it. It even has the hype sticker, hype sticker. which nice. is kind of cool. Um, yeah, this album came out in uh, November 1986, and it it marked the um, first time I'd ever heard of the band Kansas as a kid. Uh, so, um, yeah, a lot of, lot of changes with this album. It was a comeback album of sorts. We're going to get into it track by track. And we're going to start off with the opening track, a little number called Silhouettes in Disguise. What do you think of this one, Jax? Great opener. Great opener. I mean, it, it, took, me, it took me by surprise. I, I should mention that this was kind of an introduction to Kansas for me. I mean, other than the the radio hits that you hear all the time, I hadn't listened to much Kansas. And this was the first one that you gave to me for, for the book to listen to you as, as a new listener. So I didn't know what to expect going into it. And then when Silhouettes in Disguise came on, I'm like, whoa, this is this is powerful. <laughs> no pun intended. I was like, hey, this was not what I was expecting. Very, um, It reminded me in many ways of uh, Survivor. If I'm going to compare it to other melodic rock, uh, similar uh, similar kind of moods, and um, I was on board. I was on board. I remember messaging you as I was listening to the first track. I'm like, so far so good. You know, I could see myself uh, buying this just based on this this first track. Yeah, it's you know, uh, Jex has a taste for the heavier stuff, so I knew, but I also knew that he would be a great addition to the book because when he you know, he commits to listening to something. He he does just that. He listens hard. He makes notes. He does a good job at it. But I knew that um, I had a pretty good feeling he'd dig a lot of the songs in this album because it is quite rocking. It is quite straightforward. This is the first of two albums with the guitar virtuoso Steve Morse. And immediately you hear him on this album. Uh, blistering leads, but always very melodic. And yeah, it's a driving opener. And it does have that anthemic survivor quality. I think there's a few songs on here that have that. And uh, I, I've always said that Kansas or uh, that Power is an album where you really don't have to be well versed in the history of Kansas. If you just want to hear a good 80s rock album, this is the one for you. So I, I figured this album would be a, a fairly straight, uh, safe bet. Um, I first heard this in 92. That's when I got into the band, except for one song. But I first got this in 92. Uh, unfortunately, this album was not a big seller. Uh, so I found this album and its follow-up in a uh, delete bin for like $7.99 in their long boxes. So this was a case of an album that was <clears throat> overproduced and undersold. But that was cool in 92 to find brand new, you know, CDs in their long boxes. And and I might must say, like, you know, 86 and then the follow-up 88. These are early CDs, so it's a little quiet. Could do with a could do with a really nice remaster touch. But Silhouettes in Disguise, it's got a compelling chorus. And one of the things I like about it, Jax, is that they save the guitar solo till the end, yeah. which is a little bit different. It's almost like, you know, they knew I think going into this because this was their this was a reunited Kansas. I guess I should say that too. This was a reunited Kansas because they were kind of on hiatus after. Uh, the best of came out in 84 actually probably even a little before that um and it's a new lineup so steve walsh is back on this album on vocals richard williams is back on guitar billy hart on drums but uh some new people uh for steve morris and then billy greer on bass and we would come to find out in later years as a perfectly good singer in his own right billy and steve were playing together in a band called Streets, which was Steve's, what Steve did after he left Kansas. They put two albums out, 183 and 185. So Billy came with him. So it's a revamp lineup. Uh, and, you know, they were ready to 
do great things, I think. You can hear the enthusiasm. So, yeah, Silhouettes in Disguise has people that might have been following whatever Steve Morse did. Oh, I can't wait to hear the solo. They make you wait till the end. And it just, the payoff is great. So, yeah. um, nice, you know, things are in, well, I can't talk today. I don't know why. <laughs> things are getting off to a good start. Pull the words out. <laughs> and I write, you know, I've written three books. That's scary. <laughs> anyway. Next up, speaking of anthemic, we have the title song, Power. Um, I know what I think about this song, but what are your thoughts on it? Well, I, I think you, you said it perfectly, that one word, anthemic. It, it's, it's an anthem, and it sticks in your head, man. Like, I was, because I knew we were going to be talking about power, On my, you know, when I drove here, I'm, I'm recording from my office, so I drove here, and I, that's all I could blame my head was power, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. the, the chorus will just, it, it, it sticks to your head. It sticks in your head like gum to a shoe. It's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a great song, uplifting. It's, um. I, I like it a lot. I like that. That's all. That's all I can say, plain and simple. And the best thing I, you know, and 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 when I say what I'm about to say, it might sound like an insult. It's not. This song sounds like it could have been on a movie soundtrack in the '80s. This could have been. This could have been 100%. a Rocky movie. There's that Survivor thing again. But this song could be played at sporting events, uh, NASCAR. I mean, <laughs> the, the you know, Olympics. It, it, yeah. Somehow. This song, and I have to think it was poor promotion. This only hit like 84 on the charts. It was the second single. And it was like, how does how did this miss? This is irresistible. But anyway. Yeah. Um, so even though I think the album underperformed, um, the reason I know about it is because I happened to catch the video for this song here, All I Wanted, which was the first single from Power. Um, and this is, I think, their, their best bet and I think they they were smart about this to get um, a radio hit in 1986. And I think it's a great mid-tempo rock ballad, and it did okay. It was a top 20 single in the States. It peaked at number 19. The video got some play on Much Music, which, again, that was my introduction to a band called Kansas. And it's just funny because I talk about this in the book. Um, it was also around the same time that Boston came back with Third Stage. They're both on MCA and they're both, you know, named after places. And I just took for granted, okay, well, there's a lot of these bands then that are named after places. And, uh, but yeah, I, you know, I know you lean towards the heavier stuff. What did you think of it? And I kind of warned you, like, look, this is a little mellow. Yeah, Cause I don't want you to, <laughs> I don't want you to go to sleep or anything. So what did you think of all I wanted? All I wanted, uh, I, I, I still like it again. I'm not overly familiar with the with the songs right now, so I can't place the the rhythm or the, or the beat. But I don't. There's no song on here that I hate it or is like, oh, this is this is too light. There's a balance here between a little bit heavier and then a little bit more melodic. And I the sequencing was just right, so nothing put me to sleep or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I it, it was fine. It was fine. It's um, yeah, that's all I can say is that I'm not I could try to revive your memory, but I'm not going to attempt to match Steve Walsh because he does a great job. This is a great vocal performance on this song, but uh, it's pretty keyboard heavy. There's not a lot of guitar in it until the end. Steve Morse does get a few guitar licks in. And, you know, sadly, Steve Morse has had this long career he was in the Dixie Dregs. He, he did all kinds of solo albums. And of course, he joined Deep Purple and a lot of other things, Flying Colors. I think this is the only top 40 single he's ever co-written or in and played on which is kind of surprising considering his long career but yeah no it did okay but i think it should have done a little bit better but and you are right i think this album is very well sequenced some albums suffer from poor sequencing and it's a funny thing because you can listen to something and go well i don't know and like each of the songs but there's an effect that you get from the sequencing good or bad and i think this album is is just right with the sequencing it's when it's time to slow down, they slow down. When it's time to pick back up, that's exactly what it does. That's perfect. And uh, I want to address too. You mentioned uh, Boston's third stage, and I, I mentioned that in in this chapter is that it it boggles my mind that this couldn't have been as successful. Same label, they were released just I think months apart. It was, it was yeah. Close. And I think had it been giving had let me try to find my words. Had it I hear you. Given, it's in the air. Yeah. <laughs> you're contagious no had it yeah. been given the same kind of promotion because third stage i think did fairly well for boston third stage uh, yeah right yeah but 
this one it, it it could have had the same because to me they're both good albums but this one might even i think i might like it even better than third stage a little bit oh and i i i think this is far more consistent than third stage and i'm a boston fan but hey so it, yeah. it makes no sense to me that it couldn't have been as successful if not more successful so definitely somebody missed the mark as far as promoting goes because this should have been i i have to think that the blame has to lie with MCA because it was the same label for both. Both of these bands had been on CBS. I mean, of course, Boston's first album was like a huge seller. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many albums it sold in its initial run, but I think it's at about 16 million now. But it was big at its time too. And, and don't look back <laughs> because the first album was so big. It's one of those that it's considered a drop off in sales, even though it still sold millions. It's kind of like comparing Michael Jackson's Thriller to Bad. You know, oh, Thriller sold 52 million, but, you know, Bad only sold 37 million. The kid's slipping. <laughs> um, and, and meanwhile, Kansas didn't sell as many albums as Boston, but Left Overture and Point of No Return were huge albums for them. And yeah, and, and here they were. Here's Kansas coming back after two years. Here's Boston coming back after eight years. And they didn't even do any videos. Right. That's so right. I, I don't know. There's just there's a there's a it's it's not in balance there. But anyway, moving on. Uh the next track, Secret Service. This is a this is an interesting song. Um there's some really cool production tricks in it. Uh but yeah, Jax, your thoughts on, on this one. This is another one in the same in the same vein as power. It's got that chorus that just sticks to you, and it, it's a simple formula. The chorus is just repeating the title, right? Like power does it. And then this one's the same thing. It's just secret service. But I, I can't think like my fist goes up automatically, like secret service. It's uh it, it's again, it's powerful. I keep using that word, which is you know, that's the name of the album is power, but it's yeah, this one again, when I first heard this, I just oh I was all of a sudden I'm I'm awake. I'm like, hey, this is this definitely grabs the attention. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And an interesting midsection. There's all these orchestral hits. They do that a lot on this album too. Um, lyrically, it's a little bit different for them, but it, it, it's yeah, it's a cool little song, and I like how it segs into the next song because mm. it kind of uh, fades out, and then and then you hear Phil Ehars <laughs> goes yeah. into this really really fast shuffle. We're not alone anymore. This is one of my favorites on the album. It's this one is is it's fast, it's melodic, it's got heavy parts. The drumming is insane. Uh, yeah, what do you think of this one? Um, again, so, some songs are hard for me to go back and and, and place, but yeah, there's not a dud on. We here. work really hard making sure our co-hosts <laughs> are ready on here. Usually, this is the one that goes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. They see, but uh, also, you know, Tim, I don't want to say too much because I want people to go out and buy the book and read what I have to say. Oh, right, ladies and gentlemen, Jack's with a good save. <laughs> <laughs> you got to buy the book, ladies and gentlemen. We're not going to give you it all for free here. Uh, but yeah, no, again, uh, consistency. There's consistency here, and uh, that's another more fast-paced one. And uh, yeah, again, I was just, I was surprised. I was surprised because if. You know, you, you try not to judge a book by its cover, but it's hard not to think, oh, well, they're just all going to sound like Wayward Son or they're all going to sound like Dust in the Wind. So then when you kind of open those doors and you're like, hey, wait, no, no, there's there's content here. There's That's the fun thing. And, and, and I, I've really enjoyed that sort of um, it's not sneaky. That's not the right word. It's introducing people to the variety that this band has. Um, and it's fun to hear back from people like you. And you're not the only one. I've heard this back from a lot of people say, wow, this is really, this is heavy, this rocks, this, I wasn't expecting this. And, and, and I'm like, right, you know, and it's a, it's a really good, solid listen. And it amazes me. It didn't even go gold. It just, it, it's, a, it's, it's a shame that uh, it didn't, it didn't get more attention, but, you know, I think you can still, you still get it. I don't know how easy it is to get a new copy of it. I really don't. I've had mine for so long, but uh, yeah, it's a really, uh, I don't want to say it's a safe listen, but like I said, you know, it's it's. It, I wouldn't want to throw anybody headlong into one of their '70s, like really, really heavy prog albums. When I say heavy, I mean heavy on the prog. 
you know, lots of the, you know, the violin, the violin, there's no violin here. This is a good way. This is a good gateway to, to say, Hey, you know, listen to the way this guy sings, listen to the way this guy plays drums. So, yeah. so now we're going to flip the record over and we start off with a really, really cool uh, instrumental called Musicato. Mm -hmm. This without having any lyrics, Jax, I find this anthemic. Da -da -dun, da -da -dun, dun, da -da -dun. Like this makes almost makes you want to exercise. You know, <laughs> I'm not an exercise guy. So you know, Jax is just hundred percent. And again, like the other, like uh, you said earlier, for power, this one could have been in a movie. You know, could have been in a montage. It's uh, and it's only it's yes, like training <laughs> montage. Yes, <laughs> it's it's three minutes and a half. Three and a half minutes and um so much going on in those in that three and a half minutes it's like it's it's progressive despite being so short and uh yeah very good song very good song um i love what steve morse does here you know great uh big guitar on the song yeah steve morse is steve morse kind of reminds me a little bit of neil sean because he he's a re you know he's a he's a he can shred you know he's got amazing guitar chops but he can be really melodic and come up with these guitar lines that almost serve as vocal lines da -da 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 like you just they get in your head and i'd like how this this track kind of dissipates and next we're into probably the close if somebody had heard dust in the wind and maybe thought okay well maybe they have all acoustic songs well here's the one for you it's taking in the view um this to me is a, a great it, it's a perfect time to slow things down a little bit this is a nice little i don't want to say diversion but it's it's def, it's different from anything else on the album but um i really like the lyrics to this song it's about you know it's about life going forward and moving on but it's talking about some older place some building that got torn down and um it's very evocative, you know, in one of the rooms, all the walls were blue, you know, hidden from view, just the place for taking in the view. And it's like, hey, and I talk about this in the book, it reminds me of a very specific place, which I'm not going to reveal. But um, yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is probably the mellowest song in the album. But what are your thoughts on this one? Um, again, not much to say. Uh, like you said, it's a very, very slow melodic, but um after musicato it's kind of nice to just okay calm things down for a bit before picking them back up again it's um again i i can't i can't stress how the sequencing on this album is, is really well laid out um yeah i again a good slow song that's that's all i could say and not only is it well sequenced i think it's really well produced a guy named andrew <laughs> powell produced this album and i don't have anything else in my my collection that he's produced but i think this production has aged really well and not all 80s productions do i think this sounds pretty high fidelity even today mm, absolutely so now we have what may be the heaviest song on the album three pretenders i know i think jex messaged me in particular about this song wow this is cool <laughs> um it's in a it's a drop d uh, it, you know, which didn't always happen all the time. And the bass is in drop D. You can hear in the chorus when the that low bass note drops a doo doo doo. doo you're like, ah, man. Yeah. and it's Kansas, right? You know, people might be saying, "Did Kansas have a song?" Yes, they do. <laughs> like yeah. it's just, it's really good. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure this was the song that you you messaged me about. Like, whoa! And uh, when when Jex messaged me back with whoa, that's him saying, "I really like this song." <laughs> So. yeah that's my that's like my stamp of approval is whoa. yeah but it's true because you're saying that and when i listen to the album again like the few times i listened to the album was while working i'm at the office so i have it on spotify and you know the songs that's why i don't really know the titles because the songs just play and i'm kind of absorbing them but this one here i know i had to stop and be like whoa what's this one called because it really it, it actually made me stop in my tracks and go check it out like okay i need to remember this title because it, it, it it's really good like like you said it's probably the heaviest on the album and it just this it keeps getting you by surprise you know it's uh yeah um, and jex was even jex is great at putting a little work in even when you don't ask him 
um, because I, I'm still not sure what this particular song's about. I don't know who the three pretenders are. Nobody seems to know. But in the book, like he he tried to look it up, and nobody there's this just doesn't seem to be. And that's great. That's great. It's <laughs> I, it's I, I tried. <laughs> um, it's great in that people can interpret things in a different way. Um, our buddy Mike Ladano had a different interpretation that I never thought of before, and so you know that mystery is good. Uh, but it's a great song. It's it's a great, really driving kind of song. So next up, we get another um, really. I, I'm surprised this wasn't a single because it's so catchy. Tomb 19. And this song, you know, this is evocative too. I'm picturing an Indiana Jones movie, but I don't know. What were your thoughts on this? I mean, Jax, Jax and I talk a lot because Jax is a big movie buff. And, uh, and I was like, does this not sound like a soundtrack song to you? And he's like, yeah, it totally does. So yeah. Yeah, what are you, when you heard this one, this, did this uh, do anything particular for you? Uh, well, yeah, well, this I, I agree with the Indiana Jones thing, and um, I I keep thinking like there are so many missed opportunities. Like we talked about the lack of promotion, but also like to not only Tomb Nineteen, but uh, like you know Power or uh, there was uh, All I Wanted. Like those, a lot of those could have been on movies. And in '86, there were big movies coming out. You know, you had Top Gun, you had Karate Kid Two, all like movies that these would have been perfect fit for. Like I. And, and and movie yeah. soundtracks were huge in that they would spin off multiple hit singles at the same time because they were all by different artists. You think of Footloose yeah. or Dirty Dancing or like you said, Top Gun. It meant something to to be to ha uh, be in a movie soundtrack. And and yeah, if any of these songs had hooked into a movie, it, it could have just been a totally different story. I mean, um, there's a reason that you know the 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 two best known survivor songs are I, the tiger and burning heart, their connection to the Rocky movies. Right. And they, they're evocative of that. So yeah, it's just, it's too bad, but you know, the, the nice thing is that it's there for people to go back and discover like yourself. Mm, yeah. And then we wind down um, with probably the only ballad on the album, but I would definitely call it a power ballad. Can't cry anymore. This song was originally done by a group called the producers and I don't know a lot about that group. I do know that they were from Atlanta, Georgia, which is a neighboring state. So they knew, I think that these two bands knew each other quite well. Um, I've listened to the producer's version. It's similar, but different. Uh, and it only came out the year before. But I think this is a tour de force for Steve Walsh. I think his vocals are amazing on the album uh, and particularly this song. Um, you know, yeah, okay, maybe power ballads might not be your thing. Curious what you think about this one. I, I think it's a beautiful ballad. Like, uh, yeah, like you said, I do like the heavier stuff, but I can appreciate, I can admit when a ballad is good, and this is a, a good ballad and a great way to close the album. And when I was listening to it, I, I remember just thinking like this, I could picture this on Top 40 radio. Like, why wasn't this like well, the kind of stuff you would have heard back then? It was a single, and it did okay. get a little bit of play. Uh, and I would invite anybody that that uh, hasn't seen it to check out the video for this song because there's a fairly famous actor, I think he's since passed away, but that that plays the producer uh, on this album. Um, guy by the name of Richard Belzer. Okay. From, uh, Law, is it Law and Order? I'm not up on act actors and stuff like that. But yeah, as soon as you put it on, you're like, oh, that guy. That guy yeah. And uh, it, it's kind of humorous, actually, because, I mean, it's kind of a serious song, serious lyrically. But I don't want to spoil it too much, but they keep adding instruments and, and musicians, like a, horn, like, a, like a marching band comes in and starts playing. It's a different mix than the album because they keep adding all of these instruments. So finally, the whole studio is just teaming with people. It, it, it's a shame it didn't catch on. So it's, it was an interesting idea, not your typical just having the band in the studio playing but yeah so that that th thus ends the album um it hit it hit peaked at number 35 on billboard I, i'd be curious to know how many copies it actually sold but it didn't it didn't sell enough to certify gold great album um if you're a fan of steve morris you definitely want to hear this album if you've never checked it out and if you just like a good 80s rock album i would highly recommend this i've highly recommended it and 
I think it sits very well in the Kansas catalog because it shows how diverse they could be. It shows how many different sides to this band there were. There are prog elements to this album, but mostly it's just a really good, just they concentrated on writing great songs, memorable choruses, and like I said, it's well-produced. Just a great album. It, it's pretty. It's a pretty safe album to, to show somebody to play because, you, like I said, you don't necessarily have to be a frog head or you don't necessarily have to been well versed on everything they had done before just like just listen to this album tell me what you think and you know we rail on mca a lot you know i, I do that with with uh, albums that didn't sell that i think should have a lot but i think that this album um should have had the same effect for kansas in terms of uh, an older prog band mounting a comeback in the 80s um if you think back to 1983 when yes put out 90125 they were gone like they 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 pretty much were on hiatus too for three years and out of nowhere they have a revamped lineup they put up this album and they have a song on a lonely heart out of nowhere becomes this enormous hit number one song and it went on to sell three four million copies and revitalized their career it's the reason yes are still able to tour today because they had that rejuvenation that comeback this should have done the same thing for Kansas. I think it's got, it's every bit as good. It's every, it's got, you know, they could have gone deeper with the singles on this album and uh, it's just a shame. But like I said, it's still there for people to discover. And Jex did a fine job at learn, not learning the album, but becoming familiar with it and, yeah. and giving some great insights on, um, you know, the answers to the questions, checks in the mail, Jex. You told me to say something nice. No, um, yeah, I, and 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 listen, uh, like everyone, I and I really appreciate your contributions to this book. And uh, by the way, if you look close enough, there is a reference to this the the album Power somewhere on the artwork. Uh, I'll have the link to purchase the book below. If you've never listened to this album, do yourself a favor and go check it out. Um, so there you go, Jax. Thanks for sitting in. You'll be seeing Jax again in one context or another because he's a constant. He's a mainstay. He's our Rudy Sarzo. I always say that. So thanks, everybody, for watching this edition of Tim's Vinyl Confessions and the Kansas Deep Dive. We'll see you next time.